Amen. Romans chapter 8. Let's talk about how the Holy Spirit leads us. Romans chapter 8, and we're going to start reading in verse 18. Romans 8, verse 18. Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to this present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know how we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Look at Romans 8.28, one of the most loved verses in the whole Bible. And we know that in all things... God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to minister to us. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people that you love so much. And thank you for your presence with us. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just give us the ability to receive the word of God today. Lord, I pray we would encounter you through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees, would you say amen and amen. Romans chapter 8 is one of the greatest chapters in the entire New Testament. In fact, in the entire Bible. Last week we started looking at Paul's words in Romans 8, 14. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. We saw that the leading that Paul means is not what we suppose. Although the Holy Spirit does lead us in our relationships, that's not what Paul is talking about in Romans 8. It's true, the Holy Spirit does lead us in our careers, in our finances, but that's not what Paul is talking about here. The Holy Spirit does lead us in our day-to-day -day decisions, but that's not exactly what Paul is getting at. The leading of the Holy Spirit in Romans 8 is his leading us out of bondage to sin and into the beautiful freedom of holiness. The Holy Spirit leads us in killing sin so that sin doesn't kill us. Talked about how just like the law of aerodynamics lifts us above the law of gravity, so in the life of every believer in Christ there is a new law at work. It's the law of the Spirit and it lifts us above the law of sin and death. Looking at the back half of Romans 8, we see another dimension of the Holy Spirit leads us, of the Holy Spirit's leading. The Holy Spirit leads us through this life and into glory. From bondage to sin to holiness in the first half of Romans 8 and from holiness to glory in the second half of Romans 8. How does the Holy Spirit lead us into glory? Looking at Romans 8, I see three things that I want to share with you quickly this morning. How does the Holy Spirit lead us into glory? Three things. Number one, the Holy Spirit gives us eternal perspective when we're frustrated. The Holy Spirit gives us eternal perspective when we're frustrated. Paul says that life here is frustrating. And the reason that it's frustrating is because the whole world is broken. Nothing in this world works the way God originally intended. Though it's still very beautiful, creation is broken. 
When God created the world, it was a perfectly self-sustaining environment that was perfectly hospitable for mankind, over which man was perfectly in control. Beloved, listen to me. In the beginning, Mother Nature was not in control. Father Adam was. But when Adam sinned, a curse came upon the earth, and that changed everything. Nature became hostile towards mankind. Paul says creation is groaning. It is waiting in hope for the day when God will reverse the curse and restore the earth. And that day is coming. And not only is creation groaning, but we groan too. As a result of the curse, we work hard and survival is a struggle. At some point in our lives, we all must start working, and once we do, we pretty much have to keep on hustling until the game is over. As a result of the curse, pain is part of our experience now. Physical pain, emotional pain, relational pain, spiritual pain. As a result of the curse, our, our personal relationships are a struggle beginning right at home with our marriages and our kids. As a result of the curse, our human society is broken. But above everything else, as a result of the curse, we are broken. Paul says we groan. But in the midst of our groaning, the Holy Spirit gives us hope. Paul says that our groaning is like the groaning of a woman in labor. Although she is in real pain, the outcome is going to be very soon, and the outcome is going to be very good. Paul says that we in all of creation, we are waiting in eager expectation. A good way to picture that word might be someone waiting on a train platform, straining his neck, looking down the tracks to see if the train is coming. The Holy Spirit reminds us that our present circumstance is not where our story ends, but our final destination is glory. Paul says our present suffering is not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. A parallel passage is found in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 where Paul says our light and our momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. You know what's ironic about Paul's words is that there was nothing light at all about his troubles. Paul suffered more for Christ than anyone in history. Neither were Paul's troubles momentary. They persisted throughout his entire ministry and they eventually claimed his life. But light and momentary was the perspective that the Holy Spirit gave Paul against the backdrop of the hope of glory. And the Holy Spirit gives us that very same perspective. What is the hope of glory? Well, for one thing, it's the hope of a transformed body that is like Christ's resurrection body. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says we groan inwardly longing to be clothed with our permanent resurrection body. Our earthly bodies are subject to the aging process. They're vulnerable to injury and sickness. They're exposed to pain. We experience weariness and fatigue. We need rest. We are destined to die. But our resurrection bodies are gloriously impervious to all of these things. In the age to come, we will never grow old. We will never suffer sickness, nor injuries, nor pain. We will never get weary. We will never face the fear of death. What is the hope of glory? Another thing it means is the completion of our moral transformation. In Romans 7, Paul says that sin wages war in the members of his body. Finally, he cries out, who shall deliver me from this body of death? The answer is Jesus will. The process of being delivered from sin begins here on earth, but it culminates on that day when we finally receive our resurrected bodies. You know what a wonderful thought that is. One day we will be impervious not only to sickness and aging, but we'll be impervious to temptation. One day we will never again have to worry about failing our Lord. 
We'll never have to worry about falling short of his standard. We'll never have to worry about disappointing him or hurting others that we love. What is the hope of glory? Another thing it means is that God is going to bestow on us a portion of his own glory and he's going to assign us to a position of authority. Jesus talked about our hope of glory. He said, then the righteous are going to shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. God is going to clothe us with his own glory. Personally, I believe that Adam and Eve were uh, clothed with that same glory in the garden. Jesus was clothed with that glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. And again, when John saw him on the Isle of Patmos. When we're frustrated with our circumstances, when we're groaning under the weight of our work, when we're groaning because of broken human society and broken relationships, the Holy Spirit reminds us that this is not our final destination. I have to say that this last trip that I made to Nepal was a labor of love. It came at a time when I didn't want to be away from Denise. She just lost her mom. It came at a time when I didn't want to be away from you. I didn't want to be away from phase two. And the conditions were tolerable, but they weren't the easiest. The bed at the hotel was literally like a piece of plywood with a sheet over it. And the power goes off and on constantly in Kathmandu, so there were many nights without air conditioning, and the humidity was 85% or higher the entire time. And since I was preaching three services a day for six days, I was up most of the night every night getting ready for the next day's sessions. The bathroom had a western toilet, thank you Jesus. But the shower head just sticks out of the wall and there's no shower curtain and there's no shower enclosure. So when you shower, everything in the bathroom gets soaked. And for the whole week I was there, no one came once to change the bed sheets or to give a new towel or to clean the bathroom floor. And remember, in 85% humidity, like nothing dries out. And the water was mostly cold and it smells bad. So you have to remember to brush your teeth with bottled water. So for a week, I took cold showers, and I shaved with cold water. And I made the mistake, when I ran out the door, I grabbed a travel-sized bottle of conditioner and not shampoo. And the hotel doesn't give shampoo, so I washed my hair for a week in cold water and conditioner. So (laughs) the good thing was, after the third day, I didn't need gel anymore. They picked me up at 8 every morning and they brought me back after 8 every evening. And during the day, this was the only toilet that was available. So you just prayed that nature didn't call. And if nature called, you just suppressed it. And suppressing it is not easy when they're feeding you curry three times a day. But I have to tell you the truth, all of that was not too hard to endure. First of all, the presence of the Lord was with us in a wonderful way. Secondly, I had the joy of being in the company of some of the loveliest people on earth. But most of all, I was just visiting. I was just passing through. Kathmandu is not my home. It is not my final destination. I have a permanent home right here in Tony, Greenwich, Connecticut, with an abundant supply of all the things that I was missing in Kathmandu. And no curry. (laughs) And I had a ticket in my hand that said, no matter what happens, come Thursday evening, I am out of here. Beloved, listen to me. Temporary inconvenience is very tolerable when we have the reassurance that it is only temporary. And that is precisely the perspective that the Holy Spirit gives us when we're frustrated in life. His presence is with us in a wonderful way. We have the joy of traveling with some of the loveliest people on earth, the family of God. But best of all, we are just visiting. We are on our way home.
And the Holy Spirit inside of us is like a ticket in our hand that says not too many days now and we're out of here and we're going to be home. And listen, the relief that we feel when we finally get to heaven is going to be like the relief I felt when I got to my own house and I took a long hot shower in, and shampooed my hair and then I got into my glorious bed. I consider that our present... Can I tell you something? My bed... <laughs> my bed is so comfortable that when I get in my bed at night, sometimes I'm so happy, like I, I repent, like I feel guilty. I'm like, Lord, it must, it must be wrong. It must be sinful for, for me to go to bed in such kind of a beautiful down comforter and I have down pillows. And my bed is so good that when I get into it at night, I'm like, Lord, this has to be a sin. I'm enjoying it so much. You know, there's people all around the world sleeping on plywood with sheets over it. I consider... That our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. <laughs> Creation is groaning. We are groaning, but we groan in hope, looking down the track, waiting for the train that's coming to take us home. How does the Holy Spirit lead us into glory? Three things from Romans 8. Number one, the Holy Spirit gives us eternal perspective when we're frustrated. Number two, the Holy Spirit helps us pray when we are weak. He helps us pray when we're weak. Eternal perspective is infinitely helpful, but sometimes life on earth pushes us beyond frustration. Life pushes us sometimes beyond mere aggravation to despair. It pushes us to the point where we're overwhelmed. It pushes us to the point where we don't know what to do, that we get worn down. We don't know whether we should keep on fighting the good fight or just throw in the towel. And sometimes we're not even sure how we should pray. Do we pray for deliverance or do we pray for endurance to take some more? Do we ask God to help us fix it or do we ask God for permission to end it? Do we pray for more time on earth or do we pray to go home in peace? Denise and I were there just a couple of weeks ago sitting by my mother-in-law's side in the wee hours of the morning. Do we dare ask God for a miracle or do we ask God for grace to accept mom's home going? How should we pray? You know, even Jesus experienced this. When Jesus entered Jerusalem to lay down his life for the sins of the world, he cried out, Now my soul is troubled, and how shall I pray? Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this reason I came to this hour. In the garden, Jesus wrestled in prayer, Abba, if it be possible, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Paul says it is in these moments that the Spirit helps us. The word for help here in Romans 8, it means to come alongside someone and to give them a helping hand. It's like if you see someone struggling, carrying something heavy, and you rush over to help them carry the load. That word for help appears only one other time in the New Testament. It was when Martha was hosting Jesus in her home and she was pushed beyond frustration to the point that she was overwhelmed. And she pleaded with Jesus, please, Lord, tell my sister to help me. I need a hand here. I can't do this on my own anymore. This is too much for me. I'm just one person. I'm tired. I can't keep up. Doesn't anyone appreciate what I'm doing? Doesn't anyone see that I need some help, Jesus? Sometimes we feel like Martha. But it's precisely in those moments that the Holy Spirit comes alongside us with real help. And the way he helps us is through prayer. When we're overwhelmed, the Holy Spirit partners with us in prayer. As we're praying, he, he kneels right alongside us and he prays for us. 
As we're praying, he guides our prayers so that our thoughts come into alignment with God's perfect will. When we begin praying, we don't know how to pray. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But as the Holy Spirit leads us, we come into alignment. He leads us in the right direction. As we pray, the Holy Spirit leads us to a place of resignation to God's will. Nevertheless, let your will be done. We come to a place of renewed trust in God. We come to a place of renewed peace. We come to a place of renewed courage and strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. Paul's words here teach us something vitally important about prayer. Paul says that the Holy Spirit prays within us with wordless groans. Maybe you've had that experience in prayer when you're pouring out your heart to God and you just have no words left. There are just no words left in your vocabulary to express the depth of your feelings, perhaps the depth of your sorrow. Often those are the times that I pray in the Spirit. I pray in tongues. But there are other times that I've just cried in God's presence or I've just sat still quietly sighing. Paul says that God searches our hearts while we're praying. And all of that tells us something very important about prayer. Beloved, listen to me. Prayer is not a religious ritual. Prayer is the cultivation of a personal relationship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Prayer is not a formula of magic words. It is fellowshipping with God. You know that many believers in Jesus are still lured in by a superstitious notion of prayer. If I pray these words in this order and I pray it enough times, that will unlock heaven's answer. As if there is some magic open sesame. When my mother-in-law was dying, someone gave my father-in-law a book on prayer written by a very famous evangelical teacher. And the premise of the book was prayer formulas that get results. Beloved, can I tell you that is not biblical spirituality. That is pagan superstition. Jesus said so himself. He said when you pray, don't babble in vain repetition like the pagans do. No, when you pray, pour out your heart to Abba. Pour out your worship Pray, let your will be done. Prayer cannot be reduced to a formula of magic words. Sometimes the most effective prayers and the kind that please God the most are the wordless prayers that come from a holy sigh when we are in his presence. What do we do when we're overwhelmed? The Spirit helps us pray. What do we do when we don't know what to do? The Spirit helps us pray. What do we do when we want to throw in the towel? The Spirit helps us pray. What do we do when our faith is too weak to even ask God for a miracle? The Spirit helps us pray. What do we do when we want to die? The Spirit helps us pray. What do we do when we don't want to die? The Spirit helps us pray. No wonder James wrote, is anyone in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone sick? He should pray. Is anyone stuck in sin? He should confess to a brother and then pray. Does anyone need a miracle? He should pray for the fervent prayers of a righteous person. Who is righteous? We are righteous in Christ. For the fervent prayers of a righteous person accomplish much. How the Holy Spirit leads us into glory. Three things from Romans 8. Number one, he gives us eternal perspective when we're frustrated. Number two, the Holy Spirit helps us pray when we're weak. And finally, worship team, you can come help me finish. Finally this, the Holy Spirit assures us that God has a good purpose when we're suffering. We finish with one of the best loved verses in the entire Bible Romans 8, 28. In Romans 8, verse 18, Paul says, I consider 
that our present sufferings are not worth comparing. That, that word consider means to reach a conclusion. At the end of a long and careful thought process, we finally come to a conclusion. It's more than just a sunny outlook. It's more than just a positive mental attitude. It is a clear-cut Christian conviction that has been forged in me through communion with God in prayer and in His Word. I have thought about it a lot. I have searched the word concerning it. I have meditated on it. I, I have prayed through about it. And I have come to the firm conclusion that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that's waiting for us. And then Paul says there are two things that we know. First, in verse 22, we know that we live in a broken world. We know that all of creation is groaning in labor pains. We know that nature is broken. Society is broken. Relationships are broken. We are broken. In fact, everything is so broken that sometimes we don't know how to pray. But then in verse 28 is the other thing that we know. And we know that all things... Come on, I want somebody to say that with me. All things, come on, all things, come on, all things. What things? Our frustrations, our moments of weakness when we don't even know how to pray, our sufferings, whether they be for Christ or just the sufferings that we experience in this world. We know that we live in a broken world, but we also know that in all things, in financial pain, in relationship pain, in physical pain, in pain over our society, in pain over our own sinful condition, in the pain of persecution, whether light or severe, in the pain of personal loss, even in the pain of death. We know that in all these things, God is working for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Who loves Him? We do. Who is called according to His purpose? We are. And what is His purpose? His purpose is to lead us from the bondage of sin into freedom and from freedom into holiness. Let me share one final thought this morning and we're done. One last thought. What is the good that all things work towards it's not what most of us have supposed it's not the fulfillment of our American dreams here's what Romans 8.28 does not say God uses all things to work together for my creature comfort God uses all things to work together for my professional success God uses all things to work together for my personal satisfaction, for my long-term financial security, for my physical longevity and graceful aging, for my long and luxurious retirement. It doesn't say that. The good that God uses all things to work towards is my godliness. Here's what Romans 8.28 really means. God uses all things. What things? My frustrations, my worst moments of weakness, my suffering. God uses all these things to work together for my spiritual growth. God uses all these things to work together for the strengthening of my faith. He uses all these things to teach me endurance. He uses all these things to push me to grow in my prayer life. God uses all these things to produce Christ-likeness in me, to purify me. God uses all things to move me along that process of sanctification that will finally be completed on the day that I see Him face to face. Does God care about my career? Yes, He does. Does He care about my relationships? Yes, of course He does. Does he care about my health? Yes. Does he care about my readiness for retirement? Yes. But he cares much more about my readiness for heaven. Listen, Jesus promised God would bless you. 
He promised God would take care of you. He promised that your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. Look at the lilies of the field. Look at the sparrows of the air. Look at how your Father cares for them. And you are much more valuable to Him than a sparrow. God said when our delight is in Him, everything we touch will prosper. He said that when we seek Him first, He will add everything we need to get through this life. Listen, relax. God's got it all covered. But the good that God is working toward in every moment of your every day, in everything that you encounter and endure, is your preparation for glory. Oh yes, there are two things we know. We know that we live in a broken world. But we also know that God is using all of these things to work together for our good and His glory. And how do we know it? We know it because the Holy Spirit inside of us assures us that it's so. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus a great big praise in this place this morning?